All right, we're back. Second half of the immune system. We are getting into the fun, fun stuff. Um, these are the adaptive defenses. Um, specif all this stuff will make sense when we cover it. So the specificity and the memory will all make sense, um, as will these two different branches. Um, so we're going to have humoral immunity, which is really going to be antibodies. And we're going to see that is going to be mediated by our B cells. And then cellular immunity, uh, bleh, immunity is going to be mediated by our T cells. Um, both branches of your adaptive defenses are run by cells, but because the antibodies float around in the blood or the humor, the uh, antibody run part of your adaptive defenses is called humoral immunity. Um, so we want to talk briefly about lymphocytes and briefly about how they interact with antigens. Um, so one thing that I just want you to understand, it's not hugely important, is that every single pathogen, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, can produce many, many, many different antigens. So each individual protein can be recognized or bits of any individual protein can be recognized by multiple B cells or multiple T cells. Um, so it's just something to think about when you're, when we're talking about activating the B cells and the T cells that you need to fight any antigen, it is in actuality going to be many different T cells and many different B cells that are able to recognize as foreign many different parts of any given pathogen. Um, so a little bit about what is called immunocompetence. Um, this means that your cells are able to do what they're supposed to do for the immune system, even if they haven't been called to do it yet. They get quality control tested before they leave. Um, there are two parts to this. I'm kind of overgeneralizing it because it works a little bit differently for B cells than it does for T cells. And I understand the T cell maturation process a little bit better. Um, but there are two things that all of your immune cells need to do. One is that they need to ignore proteins that are supposed to be in the body. Um, so whether you're a T cell or a B cell, if you're exposed to a protein from the heart or the lungs or the kidney, um, you're not supposed to react to it. Um, and that's physically testing physical parts of the cell that interact with potential antigens then there are receptors on both your B cells and your T cells that allow them to interact with other immune cells. So they physically touch one another and communicate and dump proteins on each other um, so that they can coordinate immune responses. Um, so they also need to be able to properly interact physically with other parts of your immune system. If they fail either part of this, um, if your B cells fail this in the marrow, or if your T cells fail one of these tests in the thymus, they are encouraged to undergo apoptosis or program cell death, and they take themselves apart very carefully so as not to spill their guts and cause inflammation. Uh, and then they will whisper for a macrophage to come over and clean up the mess before there's inflammation. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, oh, and I lost the slide. Um, somewhere in here it should say B cells mature in the marrow and T cells mature in the thymus. They, that might have been back in the lymphocyte page of the lymphatic system, but you want to make a note of that. Um, so then, now we are talking about humoral immunity, so the humoral branch of your adaptive defenses. Um, this is your antibodies. So they're made by cells, but they float around in your humors. So we call it humoral immunity. Um, this is what your basic antibody looks like. Um, it has a variable region and a constant region. Um, the variable region is different for every 
untested lymphocyte in your body. Um, and this is what where the specificity comes in. So if you are a B cell named Steve, um, and this is Steve's antibody, maybe Steve's antibody sticks to chicken pox. Um, Steve's antibody is then not going to stick to the polio virus or um, botulinum uh, microbes, different bacteria. Um, so each antibody is specific to an antigen, a specific bacteria or a specific virus, and even, you know, just some specific part of one bacteria or one virus. Um, so you have a billion or so different variable regions floating around in your body. Um, then you have the constant region. So the variable region, as I said, determines what the antibody is going to stick to. The constant region determines what's going to happen after it sticks, sort of how that antibody is going to interact with the rest of your immune system, and also where. So as your B cells migrate um, into different parts of your body, they can churn out the same variable region, right? So one B cell is always fighting HIV, but it's making this kind of anti-HIV antibody um, for the bloodstream and this kind of anti-HIV antibody, which is going to be in the mucus, uh, you know, and what am I looking for? Well, you'll get the idea as we go along. Um, so, you know, each each individual lymphocyte makes a different variable region to fight a given antigen, and then it can hook that variable region up to all of these five different constant regions so that that antibody can fight that same specific antigen in different ways and in different places. So we're going to go over the ways first, um, and then we'll come back to this because I spent too much time talking about this already. Um, so constant regions will make more sense once we understand um, some of the different antibody functions. Um, so the first thing you need to realize is that all antibodies work essentially the same way in that they attach to something that is not supposed to be in the body and mark it as foreign. Then depending on the nature of the antigen or the type of antibody we're talking about, you get different results. Um, but the, the basic function of an antibody is to stick to things that aren't supposed to be into the body and render them inactive and mark them for destruction. And that's why if you're looking here, all of these different antibody functions also make it easier for phagocytes to come along and endocytose or phagocytize the antigen. Um, so there's a lot of similarities, a lot of the differences between these different functions just have to do, has to do with the nature of the antigen. Um, and the first slide, I just lumped these two together, but they are technically speaking different things. Um, so first up, if we just want to understand neutralization, um, we will go back to that picture of how COVID works that we had before. And we said that these gray spike proteins interact with the, what is it, angiotensin converting enzyme on the surface of the cell. So this physical interaction between the gray spike and ACE2 is responsible for getting the virus inside the cell. If antibodies stick to all of the gray spikes, they can't attach to the angiotensin converting enzyme and they can't get inside the cell. Um, so the simple act of sticking to the dangerous parts of a virus or a bacteria means they can't then interact with your body in ways that might make you sick. You'll also notice if you're looking here or if you're looking over here, right, the variable region sticks to the surface of the antigen. The constant region is now hanging out in space. Um, some of your constant regions are like sugar for macrophages. Macrophages really like them. Um, really what they are is like handles. So just like um, the complement gives macrophages something to grab onto, 
antibodies can give macrophages something to hand on to hang on to and opsonization because it involves specific binding sites on the constant region is one of the antibody functions that's dependent on the constant region. Um, so here then is agglutination. Agglutination is what happens when you have these IgM antibodies. So here you have one, two, three, four, five different copies of the original antibody all linked together in this pentagram shape. That makes this version of the antibody really good at binding more than one antigen. Um, so if each antibody can hold on to more than one antigen and um, well, yeah, we'll leave it at that, right? And antigens can be bound by more than one antibody. This shape is extremely efficient at getting things to clump. Um, so whether you're talking about um, surface proteins on a virus or a bacteria or surface proteins on red blood cells where you get that agglutination reaction, if you are cross-linking cell surface antigens and causing clumping like this, this is called agglutination, right? And it does two things, right? If you cross-link all of these viruses, they can't circulate. It's harder for them to go find another target to infect. And then also, they're already, like it's having criminals all handcuffed together before the cops even show up, right? So once a macrophage shows up, the macrophage doesn't have to chase down each one of those individual viruses. If it catches one of them, it catches all of them. So now instead of hunting individual viruses, macrophages are just picking them up by the dozens in these big clumps. Um, so that is agglutination if it is a cell surface or a cell bound antigen. Then you have precipitation. Um, this is exactly like agglutination, only in this case, the antigen is soluble. So it's something like snake venom um, or botulinum toxin, right? That, that's where Botox treatment comes in. It causes paralysis. A little bit of Botox in your face reduces wrinkles, makes you look real weird because you don't have regular facial expressions. Um, but you know, when you're not actually trying to speak and appear human, you look good. Um, so at any rate, I use snake venom, right? So the snake releases the venom into your bloodstream. If it is just floating around freely, it can interact with different neurotransmitter receptors um, and cause paralysis or um, rigor, depending on what kind of receptor it's interacting with. So it can shut down muscles, it can shut down nerves, cause all kinds of problems. Um, but if you have antibodies that can stick to the venom and cross-link the venom, Right, you're doing two things. One, you're kind of neutralizing the venom. If it's stuck to an antibody, it's probably not going to be able to stick to a neurotransmitter receptor. But also now you have clumps of venom and it's much easier now for a macrophage to come along and scoop up big clumps of venom as opposed to having to track down individual venom molecules. So that's precipitation. Uh, then you get complement fixation, which we've already talked about. Um, so here's our friend complement, again, the C1 complement complex. Um, if you have antibodies that recognize an antigen on the surface of a pathogen, and they have the proper sequence in their constant region, right, that complement specific constant region will activate the complement cascade and you'll get the opsonization, inflammation, and membrane attack complex. Um, so again, now this right makes a little bit more sense. This is for agglutination um, here, right? This is for opsonization, um, and I think this is too. Um, but if you have this complement or this constant region, you're really good at opsonization. If you have a different complement re constant can't speak today. Uh, constant region, you might be better at activating complement. Uh, and then again, also you'll see, you know, this is the, the antibody that tends to end up in the saliva. This is the antibody that tends to end up in the bloodstream. This is an antibody that's often involved in 
allergies, which means normally it would just be encouraging inflammation. And then this class is interesting. So you'll notice down here it says B cell receptor. Um, when a B cell makes this type of antibody with this constant region, that constant region gets stuck in the membrane and it acts like a hormone receptor from chapter 17. Um, so remember chapter 17, hormone hits the receptor, stuff happens inside the cell like those G protein linked receptors. So you have a similar mechanism here. Antigen hits the receptor. This lets the B cell know that this cell is now needed. There is an antigen on the loose in the body that this cell has the antibody to fight. Um, so it's just another function of antibodies that is constant region dependent. Um, so now that is the transition into, okay, how do we activate a B cell? What happens when you get infected and it's time to mount your humoral response? Um, before we get into all that, I knew I was going to jump the gun. We have to circle back and talk about these receptors. Um, so you have about a billion with a B, that's 12 zeros, um, a billion lymphocytes floating around in your body, each of which make a unique antigen receptor. So that is a unique protein. You do not have a billion different genes so that each cell can express a different gene and make a different protein. You have a couple thousand at most. Um, I was not able to track down the actual number and I'm sure it's something that changes from time to time. But so in order to get a billion or so different protein sequences or amino acid sequences from a relatively small number of genes, what your cells do is actually edit the DNA, um, which if you're like I was as an undergraduate, this should be like a mind blowing thing, right? Usually we say all the cells in your body all have the same DNA. This is why cloning is possible. This is why you can start as a fertilized ovum with 46 chromosomes and then every cell in your body has the same 46 chromosomes and they all just express different genes and that's how you get all the different cell types and here I am telling you that there is a cell type that deliberately messes with its DNA so every individual B cell is going to cut up its um, lymphocyte receptor or B cell receptor genes a little bit differently to make a unique sequence so that the protein that those genes code for is going to be a uniquely shaped protein. Um, so there are two really cool things from this. One is that, oh my god, you're editing your DNA. And two, right, the genes you inherit um, have a lot to do with your immunity. That's sort of the raw material that your immune system has to work with to develop all of your antibodies. Um, and you're going to see, or I'm going to say later on, that there's a very similar process that takes place in your T cells. As far as I know, it's almost exactly the same thing. I'm sure there are some wrinkles, but that's it. Oh, sorry, my computer is telling me it's running out of juice. There we go. And maybe the screen just got brighter for you. I didn't have it plugged in. Um, all right, so that's cool. All right, moving right along then. So where are we? We are talking about how to activate a B cell, which is part of your humoral immunity response. At this point now, our B cell is, where are we? Here's the term, naive. Um, it has its one unique antibody, which makes it different than every other B cell in the body, and it's never been exposed to a pathogen. So you just have this one B cell out of a billion or so with its unique antibody. Um, and if you get an infection that that B cell has, can help you fight, that B cell has to be activated, and then we need a lot of that B cell. So you're going to get clonal selection, which is what activates the B cell, proliferation, lots of mitosis, and then the progeny are going to start doing different things. So let's start then again with antigen challenge. 
which I skipped right over, this would be the first time you are exposed to something. So you are six years old, you're in kindergarten, and this is the first time somebody else shows up in your kindergarten class with chicken pox, and you get it. Um, so this is your antigen challenge. It is the first time you have been exposed to this antigen. So your body then needs to I identify the naive B cell that can fight chicken pox but has never been exposed to chicken pox. This is the clonal selection step. Um, so if you look, these three B cells all produce a different receptor, which they have produced by editing their DNA. So they're all genetically distinct or different from one another. They have different gene sequences. This one here just happened to produce produce the genes that produce the antibody that can bind to chickenpox and mark it as foreign. So now your body needs a lot of this cell in a short period of time. So following clonal selection um, is proliferation. So this stimulated B cell whose antibody receptor recognizes the chicken pox is now going to go through round after round after round of mitosis. Here they're showing you just two cells, but you want to think of thousands of cells that have now been produced that can all churn out the antibody that your body needs. These cells are all identical to each other, right, but different than all the other cells in your body. So we refer to this group of genetically identical cells as a clone. Just like if you're a Star Wars fan, it's the clone army, right? Everybody is genetically identical to Jango Fett, um, which makes me a geek for knowing it's Jango Fett, but whatever. Um, so here, this is your clone army, a whole bunch of cells that are all genetically identical, now all churning out antibody. So the cells that develop the ability to produce IgG or IgM, um, something other than this receptor, are called plasma cells and they actively secrete the, hor the hormone, the antibody that's going to go do the agglutinating or the precipitating or anything. Um, so this is part of differentiation. You go from a cell that produces the antibody as a receptor to a cell that produces the antibody and secretes it. Um, in addition to developing plasma cells, part of the differentiation step is the development of memory cells. So these memory cells stay kind of in the same state as this original cell here, where they're making the antibody that you needed at one time, and you may need again. So you want to think of this cell here as representing, again, like a couple thousand cells. Um, so maybe a couple years later when your younger brother comes home from kindergarten and he's got chicken pox and you're exposed to his chicken pox, you've already got a couple thousand cells that make the antibody that you need. Um, so you can churn out lots of antibody in a relatively short period of time because you don't have to go through this selection step and your proliferation step is much faster because you're already starting with a thousand or more um, of the right kind of lymphocytes. Um, so the differentiation is the formation of plasma cells and memory cells. And then the plasma cells secrete and the memory cells wait for the next time you get infected. So then we're just going to layer on top of that um, some terminology and some real life experience. Um, so your primary immune response is what we were just talking about. This is your first exposure to an antigen. So imagine this is time zero. This is when you get exposed. You have a lag of a couple of days before exposure, or I should say after exposure, but before you've generated enough antibodies to fight the infection. So during this time period in here, when you're going through the clonal selection, proliferation, and differentiation process, you are feeling symptomatic um, and sick, and you're also able to infect other people. Um, so that's your primary immune response. Um, lag, you get sick until you get rid of it. Then your secondary immune response, maybe months, maybe years later, um, 
starts with the activation of your memory cells. Um, now you're already a good ways up this curve here. So you start with more cells to begin with and you end up churning out more antibody. I should say this red line is supposed to represent how many antibodies you have floating around in your bloodstream. So the second time you get exposed, you produce more antibodies in a shorter period of time, and you are generally able to overwhelm the virus, neutralize it before you become either symptomatic or, um, oh, I can't come up with a word now, whatever it means, infectious. So you can't infect anybody, um, and you're also not going to transmit it to anybody. That's your secondary immune response. Um, so that again, just to make it perfectly clear, right? You get exposed, this part is slow, so your primary immune response is slower and it doesn't produce as much antibody. The second time you get exposed, you have all of these memory cells, um, you produce more, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, more antibodies in a shorter period of time and you also produce new memory cells. Um, so once you've had something like the chicken pox, um, if you are routinely re-exposed to it, this secondary immune response happens. You, you turn over your population of memory cells um, and you become immune to it again. So these memory cells don't live forever. So if you go a very long time without being exposed to something, um, you, you can be susceptible of getting reinfected. Um, but for most of us, we get exposed to something once, we develop immunity to it, and then every time we get exposed to it again, we just turn over our memory cells and then we maintain our immunity. Um, so then we have to talk about acquired immunity. This is just different ways to get antibodies into your bloodstream. Um, so, and there's, you're going to see there's four different ways. We can have active or passive and then either active or passive can also be natural or artificial. So like active, natural, or active, artificial immunity, acquired immunity. So active means, whoops, your B cells are actually making antibodies. So they've been exposed to the antigen and are making the antibodies. Passive means that your B cells are not making the antibodies. Um, so they weren't exposed to the antigen and you're getting antibodies from some outside source. Naturally acquired immunity means that either the exposure or the source is natural and artificial means either the exposure or the source was artificial. So if we put it all together, we get something that looks like this, right? So the natural way to actively acquire immunity to something is to get infected. So the first time you get chicken pox, you are acquiring, naturally acquiring active immunity to chicken pox. The artificial way to get your B cells to recognize and produce antibodies to something is usually a vaccine. So this is how all vaccines work. Um, pretty much, there's different ways to manufacture them, um, but you either get, they take the virus and they deactivate it with heat or acids or something and they chop it up into all little bits um, so that it, the bits are no longer dangerous and they inject those bits into you and then your immune system learns to recognize all of the individual bits without being exposed to an intact virus. Um, they can also manipulate the viruses in the lab, sort of edit the DNA so that you have what looks like a fully competent virus, but it's missing the genes that make it virulent or infectious. Um, so you've got all of the outer shell parts of the virus intact for your immune system to react to, but inside of it, it's missing some of the parts of its genome that actually make it infectious and transmissible. Um, so that's active. And then the natural way to passively get some antibodies into your bloodstream is from the placenta or breast milk. 
you know, than the artificial way to passively get some antibodies into your bloodstream is injecting them with like a gamma globulin shot, um, which is something they might do for snake venom. Um, just to give you that, anti-venom is immunoglobulins against snake venom and it neutralizes the venom. All right, so that's um, your humoral immunity antibodies. Now we're on to cell mediated immunity. Um, this is also complicated, but totally cool. Um, so this is your T cells. We have two main types of T cells, cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. We are not going to worry about the four versus the eight. Um, just know cytotoxic and helper T cells. Cytotoxic T cells for us, we are going to think of primarily as hunting down virally infected cells um, and inducing them to undergo program cell death so that they can take themselves out of circulation before they start spitting out more viruses that are going to go infect more cells. Um, what the helper T cells do is to activate cytotoxic T cells and other B cells. Um, as it says here, they also activate macrophages. They really are central to making sure that you have a full, robust immune response. So helper T cells is a bit of a misnomer. They should be called like super duper efficient manager director T cells. Like they, they make it all happen the way it's supposed to happen. Um, so each of your T cells, whether they're helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells, has two different proteins on the surface, a CD protein and a T cell receptor. Um, so that's here and it's a little blurry because I made a very small image big, um, but here's the receptor over here, a little bit blown up, embedded in the membrane. Um, so you'll know it has a variable region and a constant region very much like the antibodies. So you want to think of the T cell receptor as being just like the antibody. Every different T cell in your body is going to edit its DNA and produce a unique T cell receptor whose job it is to stick to stuff that doesn't belong in the body. Um, so they are very much analogous to the antibodies only they never float around in the bloodstream. They always stay stuck in the membrane of the T cell and they let the T cell know every time it's encountered a pathogen. The other protein that's on the surface of all of your lymphocytes is called a CD protein or cell differentiation glycoprotein. You are going to see later that what this protein does is allow your T cells to differentiate between macrophages and other cells in your body, like regular body cells versus immune cells. Um, that's where the differentiation comes in. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to ask it, so you do probably want to remember um, that, right, CD4 is the helper T cell and CD8 is the cytotoxic T cell. So T sub H or T sub C. The way I remember it is that if you have an infection, you call for help, call for help. So CD4 helper T cell. Cytotoxic T cells annihilate eight infections. So CD8 annihilate eight, that's how I remember it. Um, so where are we? Yeah, so you have your CD4 cells, your CD8 cells, they each have their T cell receptor, which is just like an antibody. So if these cells have never seen the antigen that they are supposed to fight before, let, let's imagine that they can both um, recognize chicken pox, but you've never had chicken pox, right? They too are naive and unique so that when you do get infected with chicken pox, you want a lot of these two cells to help you fight the chicken pox. So again, you are going to get antigen challenge, just like in the B cells, the first time you're exposed to um, this antigen, that is going to activate the T cells. There's just this one extra step here 
for T cells called co-stimulation, which we'll talk about when we get there. But you select the T cell that has the receptor that recognizes the antigen, then you make a whole lot of that T cell, and then those clones, just like with the B cells, are going to differentiate into cells that actually do the fighting and the memory cells. So it, the same basic process with this extra co-stimulation step. And I will say that where it gets complicated and what makes them diverge a little bit is the antigen challenge part. Um, so B cells just float around and can bump into an antigen just floating around and recognize the antigen. T cells have to have another cell present the antigens to them. So they are what are called antigen presenting cells, or that's what APC means, antigen presenting cell. So your uh, T lymphocytes, B cells and T cells, or not B cells, sorry, just your T cells, have to have another cell show the antigen to them. Um, and there are two different scenarios. You can have a macrophage presenting to a T cell a virus or a bacteria that it has phagocytosed and digested. So that cell is not infected and should be left alone. And then you have infected body cells um, that if they are presenting um, your T cells with an antigen, it means they have a virus hiding out inside of them and they need to die. And it is the CD proteins that allow the T cells to differentiate between whether or not it's looking at something that has been eaten and neutralized, or if it's looking at something that represents an active infection inside of a cell that needs to die. So, um, the first part of understanding um, antigen presentation is just to understand all of the players. So the first thing that happens is the CD protein is going to stick to the MHC. So it's this CD-MHC interaction that brings the two cells together. It's sort of like a docking port. That then brings the T cell receptor into close contact with our potential antigen or our antigen and then if this T cell receptor recognizes that antigen it's going to activate this T cell or tell this T cell that it's found a target um, and it needs to go to work. Um, before we can move on with the next step we do want to talk a little bit more about the MHC and how they work with the CD proteins and what it all means. So you've got two different classes of MHC, class two and class one. Um, and I'm gonna summarize this and not read everything because I'm gonna draw and try and make it a little bit more understandable. Class two MHC is used to present antigens that have come from outside the cell and have been phagocytized. Class 1 MHC is used to present antigens that were synthesized inside the cell. So they came from the cytoplasm somewhere. Um, so let's take this um, scenario here where we have two cells. Um, you have a macrophage uh, here and a lung cell. Um, which could become potentially infected with a cold virus. So if you have a virus floating around in your body, um, perhaps right, it'll get engulfed by our friend the macrophage, and you'll have to forgive my pathetic drawing skills here, right? So this virus gets gobbled up by the macrophage and then what the macrophage is going to do is chew the virus up into lots of little bitty bits. So this cell here, this macrophage is not infected. It brought a virus inside of it, chewed it up into lots of little bits. Then what's going to happen is this vesicle here is going to merge with this vesicle over here which contains your MHC2 for something that came from outside the cell and you're going to put a little piece 
of the virus onto that MHC, then this vesicle is going to go over to the membrane and deliver your MHC. So now MHC is going to be on the surface here with this little piece of virus sticking off. Um, so what this MHC2 here is saying to the immune system, I just killed this, I just ate something, take a look at it, is this something that we need to worry about that you all need to go start and fight? Um, so that's for MHC2. MHC1 is for intracellular proteins. So now let's say our friend the virus comes over here and it tricks the lung cell into letting it in so it gets inside then it decodes um, and all of that crazy stuff happens so now you have this virus starting to multiply inside of your cell what your cells do is every once in a while they just grab some protein from the cytoplasm and chop it up into little bits then all right, they put that on MHC class 1. This vesicle ends up being shipped off to the cell surface. So now you've got, oh, i got to get my right color here. Um, MHC1 on the surface with the virus attached to it. So what this now is saying, MHC1 is saying, I found this in my cytoplasm. Am I infected? Right, so if this is a virus, then there's a virus on the loose somewhere that other cells have to go help this macrophage with. If this is a virus, then this guy needs to die. Oh, that was so satisfying. Yeah. So that's the difference between MHC1 and MHC2. So you want helper T cells scanning macrophages here, um, right, T sub H, so that they can be made aware of the virus and then go help fight it. And you want cytotoxic T cells scanning potentially infected cells with MHC1 so that the cytotoxic T cells can identify the cells that have to die. Um, so if that mess doesn't make sense, maybe this will help. Right, so here you have um, cytotoxic T cell um, here, and we're presuming now that this one's already been activated, is going to scan this antigen. So it has CD8 which is going to pair it up with MHC class 1. So this is the, uh, the MHC that presents proteins that came from the cytoplasm. Um, so if this T cell receptor recognizes this antigen, then this cell is infected, that cell has to die. Um, so CD8 MHC1 um, means you are targeted for death. Um, whoops. And if I go back to the, the first one, right, CD4 um, is associated with your helper T cells. So the CD4 is going to make sure that the helper T cell is scanning this macrophage, which is using MHC2. Um, so when this helper T cell, whoops, um, recognizes this antigen, it just runs off, right? It leaves this macrophage alone to go continue to gobble up viruses, and this helper T cell now runs off and dumps cytokine on other cells and helps your B cells and your T cells fight your infection. Um, so that was a lot. So just to review, we're going back to the beginning. Step one, T cell activation. Um, antigen presenting cell presents an antigen to our naive T cell. CD8, or excuse me, CD protein docks with MHC. T cell scans the antigen. If this is the antigen that this T cell recognizes, that is the first step 
in stimulating that T cell. So we're this T cell here. Um, then we need co-stimulation, which just means um, either this antigen presenting cell or another T cell is going to, you know, produce and dump, oh, nobody can see that, um, chemicals onto that cell. So these red lines represent chemicals that are released either by the antigen presenting cell or by like a helper T cell to further stimulate this naive cell. Now it is totally stimulated. If it is in this case a cytotoxic T cell, it is going to first enlarge and form a clone um, of genetically identical cells that are then going to differentiate into actively fighting cytotoxic T cells and memory cells. The actively fighting cytotoxic T cells are going to go out and start killing things um, and the memory cells are going to hang back and wait for the next infection. So again, we were just talking about our cytotoxic T cell. Um, our CD8 cytotoxic T cell hooks up with MHC1 on a potentially infected cell. Um, if the cytotoxic T cell recognizes the antigen, the cytotoxic T cell is going to tell this infected cell to disassemble itself, and it does. Um, up here, CD4, MHC2, um, those two link together. So this helper T cell is scanning this antigen that is being presented by a macrophage. So if this cell becomes stimulated, it knows there's a virus on the loose and it is just gonna go around dumping cytokines onto, or these are just stimulatory chemicals. You don't know what a cytokine is, um, but dumping stimulatory chemicals onto other T cells and B cells to enhance and direct the immune response. Um, so that was a lot. Hopefully it makes sense. I feel like I went through it kind of quickly. It's one of the hardest things to teach, um, but it's fun. So review that a couple of times and you know make sure you take a good look at the figures. I think this is a good figure here without all of my chicken scratch additions to it. Um, oh, sorry, I just I had a thought and it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see, so then we're into just odds and ends at the end, which we'll go through pretty quickly. Um, mostly, you just want to know that your T cells don't live forever. I'm not going to ask you how long. Just know that they don't live forever um, because especially an active cytotoxic T cell is a hazard. You know, they theoretically they don't kill the wrong cells, but they could. So once the infection is over, your active T cells undergo apoptosis, and so they're no longer a liability. Plus, they're no longer um, another mouth to feed because all of your cells require energy. So if you kept all of these cells that you generate every time you get infected, your body would use up a lot of energy just keeping cells alive that you don't need anymore. Um, you do have regulatory T cells. There are all kinds of T cells that we haven't talked about. Um, but the regulatory T cells, as it says here, help dampen the immune response. Um, and yeah, we'll just leave it at that. They're, they are supposed to prevent too much inflammation in the wrong place. Um, they don't always work because we get all sorts of inflammation that we don't want, but they are there. Um, natural killer cells, again, we, we talked about them before, we're circling back. Um, now we know a little bit about what they're looking for. So let's say you have a cell that's infected with a virus and the virus has tricked the cell into retracting its MHC1. So this cell can no longer present antigens to the cytotoxic T cells. But the natural killer cell comes along and says, hey, where's your MHC1? No MHC1, you're a suspect and boom, that cell is, is no longer with us. Um, also, if there's antibodies on the surface of the cell, I'm not sure how that would happen. Maybe antibodies sticking to antigens presented by MHC1 um, or some sort of sign 
of physiological stress, which would be caused by a, a cell being turned into a virus factory. Natural killer cells can recognize that um, and induce apoptosis, programmed cell death, in cells that it deems to be infected. Um, let's see, immunodeficiencies, just know what they are. Um, really, the only thing I want you to know about HIV is that the target cell that the HIV virus infects is your helper T cells. Um, so if you are at all familiar with how a full-blown HIV infection which causes AIDS, the actual acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, if you are familiar with how that ravages the body, then that is an example of what happens when you don't have enough helper T cells. Um, so they do more than help, they keep you alive. Um, all of these I am not going to talk about. You just want to recognize them all as autoimmune diseases. Um, and this is just when your immune system treats something that's not supposed to be there, or excuse me, it treats something that is supposed to be there as something that's not supposed to be there. Um, and they all work a little bit differently depending upon whether it's a, an antibody mediated autoimmunity or a T cell mediated autoimmunity. Um, and I think most of them, many of them are antibody um, mediated, but don't quote me on that. Uh, let's see, hypersensitivities. So we just want to know the basic difference between um, immediate and delayed hypersensitivity. Um, so immediate hypersensitivity is based on the release of histamines and you get quick short-term inflammation. Um, if it gets really bad and you have inflammation throughout your body, like you get stung by a bee and you're highly allergic to bees, the bee venom circulates throughout your body. So all of your blood vessels around your body all become um, vasodilated and permeable. So all of your plasma is leaking out of your blood, uh, blood vessels everywhere. So your blood volume goes down, your blood pressure goes down, you go into hypovolemic or hypotensive shock and can potentially die. Um, so that, I should say, that's why you have EpiPens. EpiPens help fight the vasodilation, they cause vasoconstriction. Um, and uh, um, also um, the, the EpiPens cause dilation of your bronchioles so that you can breathe again. Uh, then delayed hypersensitivities. Um, this depends on the action of your T cells and this is usually when your skin slowly reacts to something that irritates it like poison ivy or if you have a latex allergy. Um, some people are allergic to certain kinds of band-aids um, and it can take a couple days to realize that. You put a band-aid on a cut everything is fine and then two or three days later um, everything outside the cut starts to get red and itchy and you realize you can't use that kind of band-aid anymore. Um, that happens to me. Uh, that's it. We're done. Just under an hour. I hope you didn't listen to this straight through because it's a brutal amount of information. Um, and that's it for the class. Congratulations on sticking through to the end of Anatomy and Physiology 2.